distribution of malicious content. You've all seen iframes. Their legitimate use is to embed content from a third party, like those annoying ads that you see, and essentially they direct your browser to grab that content from the page of a third party. This is really attractive to the commercial websites because it reduces the load on their servers and reduces to a degree the amount of content they have to generate themselves. What the hackers figured out was that an iframe didn't have to be that noticeable. In fact, you could make them so small as to be virtually unper uh, unperceptible, turning an innocent looking website into a carefully crafted trap. Better yet, thanks to web-enabled email readers and document editors, you can even embed iframes there, increasing the number of potential infection vectors substantially. For a typical iframe attack on a website, an HTML inline frame tag is hidden inside the code of a legitimate website, largely through SQL injection. Attackers use these iframes to covertly redirect your browser to a site that installs its nastiness. So the goal of the SQL injection attack is not to steal information, but instead to infect database-driven websites with malicious iframes that help them distribute their other malicious content. This way, when Grandpa visits his favorite online poker site, unknown to him, the computer he's using grabs some exploit code and runs it without his knowledge. This exploit code searches patiently until it finds a vulnerability it can exploit. It uses the opening to install some Trojan, Keylogger, botnet onto his machine. Later, when he visits his online bank, the credentials he uses are recorded and quietly transmitted to the waiting fraudsters. Since secure coding practices are the only real defense against SQL injection attacks, which are at the core of this problem, and since every site with a database backend is a potential target, the burden of protecting your computers from iframes lays with the owner of the site. That's something to think about the next time some site offers you the chance to go to a random page. Attackers have formed a substantial economy around the distribution of malicious code through iframes, allowing them to specialize in infecting both websites and victims with their various exploit tools. This, in, this line of illicit trade has evolved so much that there are actually online forums you can visit specifically offering services from iframe install botnets offering either fixed prices or access to the highest bidder. <coughs> Bulletproof hosting. Here's a technology that has seen somewhat easier times. This is how it works. A legitimate ISP sets up a hosting business where they knowingly sell services to illicit organizations and purposely avoid acting on complaints. They locate their criminal servers in countries that are usually more tolerant of cyber crimes, and thus they give their illicit customers a safe haven to evade prosecution. In his book, Cryptonomicon, Neil Stevenson actually predicted all this back in 2002. The now defunct Russian business network, with I, which iDefense helped to bring down, was one example of a bulletproof hosting site. Since their breakup, other such providers have arisen around the world. There's been a lot of attention given to these guys lately, and in fact, the press has actually been very helpful at taking some of them offline by raising public awareness and law enforcement awareness of the specific offenders. Some other recent successful takedowns include the ISPs Intercage and Macolo. Anyone have any idea where they were based? California. In both cases, the media published overwhelming evidence proving the network's primary function was hosting malicious content. Eventually, the upstream providers agreed to take them offline, essentially shutting them down. Hostfresh, a malicious outfit, uh, outfit run out of Hong Kong, <coughs> evaded being halted by the takedown of their original ISP, Intercage, 
but they were finally shut down when their new ISP, PacNet, was convinced to pull them offline, hopefully this time for good. This past August, the Latvian ISP, RealNet, was disconnected from the Internet after being exposed as a cybercrime and bulletproof hosting hub. Among their hosted systems were numerous command and control bots for the Zeus Net, for, for the Zeus Botnet. The takedown is especially significant because it marks the first time that this kind of a takedown has occurred in Eastern Europe. Let's talk in more detail now about botnets. We discussed how the bad guys can install botnet code using iframes. It was hinted that they use them to collect lots of illegal data and even to hide their various core servers. What we haven't talked about is how they actually work. Uh, well, to paraphrase comedian Bill Cosby, I told you some of those stories so I could tell you this one about fast flux networks. Fast flux is how modern cyber crooks create resilient balanced networks of infest infected computers and use them to carry out malicious actions. In effect, turning the cyberspace hunt for bad guys into an internet-based internet game of whack-a-mole. The term fast flux refers to a constant and frequent parade of changes to the visibly defined criminal network. Say a fraudster wants to attack your bank. Their first step is to register a bogus domain name, preferably something no one would ever suspect, like fakebank.com. This allows them to create links that look convincing for phishing scams and other attacks. The key is that the bad guys own the registration for this criminal domain. By abusing features of DNS, such as the time to live or TTL value, they can change the IP address of the website associated with www.fakebank.com to anything they want, as often as they want. And that's exactly how they use their botnet of zombie systems. They stand up a DNS registration providing a record that specifies initial details for the illicit domain's randomly selected current content servers. Those are actually a bunch of infected bots strewn across multiple ISPs, often in many countries. Thus, every time a user tries to go to fakebank.com, he's actually going to a different zombie. So when grandma's computer first asks her ISP's name server for the address of fakebank.com, it looks at zombie one, whose address is X. The next time she looks, the TTL has expired, so the address is refreshed, and she's told to go to zombie two, whose address is Y. And this repeats on and on. This way, no single machine is ever active in the botnet for any length of time. With the zombies acting as transient proxies for a command and control mothership, fast flux effectively complicates tracking down the, the true center of operation. The mothership is the true host. The mothership may also be updating the DNS records on the, on the name server. Fast flux, by the way, does not eradicate single points of failure for the bad guys. The mothership and the name servers are still vulnerable. But it does make it difficult to track them down, since you'd have to get access to one of the zombie systems, which are usually privately owned computers. By maintaining their rapidly changing network of unaware accomplices, and by exploiting the workings of DNS, Fast Flux does pretty well, though, when it masks the identity of a mothership. Anyone out there ever watch this movie? If you have, you may think it's awful. Uh, I certainly do. But during the first 15 minutes of this film, they give an excellent explanation of how Fast Flux works. So I highly recommend, if you want to know more, Pick up this film, watch the first 15 minutes, then turn it off before you're really, really annoyed. Obviously, this film was released back in 2006, so Fast Flux is not that new. What is fairly new is a mutation that we call Double Flux. Essentially,